It's a bright day and the birds are chirping. The sun rises from the horizon to spread its beams everywhere. The weather is congenial to spend outdoors. Everyone looks content except the poet. He is not happy with the arrival of the sun. Why? Because early morning means separation from his beloved. When you spend time with your favorite person, it seems time goes swiftly. We want time to go slowly for us. However, it does not happen in reality. Similarly, the poet is spending quality time with his lover in bed. As a lover, he neither wants the time to come to an end nor anyone to disturb his precious moments. As the sun appears at the window, he realizes that the sun rising will separate them from the bed after sharing a night of passion. He considers the appearance of the sun an act of intrusion into his privacy. Therefore, he becomes irritated and rebukes the sun for disturbing them through the windows and curtains. Like the poem, Death Be Not Proud, here the poet also personifies the sun as an old and ill-mannered man. I have discussed the meaning of personification in Death Be Not Proud. You can watch the first part of the video. The poet calls the sun busy old fool, unruly sun. He calls the sun busy because he gives his lights everywhere throughout the day. The poet uses derogatory words to the sun instead of addressing him reverently. As we know, the sun is a giant star in the solar system. If there is no sun, no life can survive. But in the poem, the mightiness of the sun is reduced to an ill-mannered, aged man. The speaker tells the sun authoritatively that lovers don't need to get up and follow him. Lovers don't need to follow any time. He angrily calls the sun a saucy, pedantic wretch. The sun is rude and overscrupulous, which means he is punctual but an annoying aged man. He tells the son that instead of disturbing them, he should go and scold the schoolboys who might be late for school and sour apprentices who are probably disappointed with their masters and are still in bed. He should also tell the huntsmen to get ready because the king will go into hunting and the farmers to collect their harvest. The poet commands the son to tell the schoolboys, apprentices, huntsmen and farmers that it is time to get ready. They are supposed to follow their daily tasks. On the other hand, the lovers don't need to follow the time. The love between the poet and his lover is not time bounded. Love surpasses time. They are free from the cycle of time that comprises hours, days and months. Therefore, they don't need the sun in the room. In the first stanza, the poet mentions two worlds, the private world and the external world. I have discussed this on the blog. In the second stanza, the poet questions the son about why he thinks he is powerful and others respect him for his beams. The poet subordinates the son's power and tells him that he is powerless in front of him. He can eclipse the sun and cloud its beam with a wink. It's another instance where the poet belittles the mightiness of the sun. By shutting his eyes, he can make the sun's rays disappear. However, he would not do that for long because he cannot stay for long without looking at his beloved. His boasts that his lover's eyes are so bright that her eyes can blind the sun. He asks the sun if the lights from her eyes have not blinded him. He orders the sun to roam the entire world and come back the next day but not early in the morning. He invites the sun to inquire whether the spice from India and gold from West Indies are in their bed. The sun will also find all those kings whom he saw the day before in the same bed. All the kingdoms are in one bed. Moreover, the poet makes a hyperbolic statement that his lover is all states and he is the prince of all states. It's a metaphysical conceit of the poem, her body is the reservoir of treasure and he compares her body to the kingdoms. In this stanza, there are references to colonialism. The lover's body is a microcosm of the colonized states that England captured during the rise of colonialism. 
we can also read this statement from a feminist point of view. Sees all states and he is a ruler of the states. Though he shares a romantic relationship with a woman, his statement suggests the dominance and patriarchy in the relationship. I have already discussed this on the blog. In the third stanza, the poet tells the son in a tone of authority that all princes imitate them. Compared to this, everything outside is an imitation. All wealth is less worthy because the real wealth is with him. The poet tells the son that he is not happier than them. Towards the end, the poet becomes sympathetic toward the son. Since the son is an aged man, he needs to work with relaxation. However, he has to warm the world. So he suggests to the son to warm them. Warming the bed would be enough for him and the world. The reason is, the entire world is there in the bed. By warming the bed, his beams will be everywhere. Therefore, he orders the sun not to go anywhere and warm them. Their bed is his center and the walls his sphere. It's another metaphysical conceit. The poet compares their bed to the earth and the walls to the path of the sun respectively. He has already mentioned that all states and natural resources are in their bed. He also believes that there is no state except the bed, a typical colonizer's mindset. Therefore, the bed represents the world. In the last stanza, the poet condenses the earth into the room. As a metaphysical poet, Don shows his awareness of the prevalent idea of the universe. By using a metaphysical conceit of the bed, he points out the geocentric model of the universe. He supports the Ptolemaic system, which states that the sun, moon, stars, and planets revolve around the earth. Since all the states lie in one bed, they represent the earth. Therefore, the poet asks the sun to revolve around the bed. However, later Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler debunked the geocentric model. Copernicus emphasized the idea that the sun is at the center of the solar system and the other planets revolve around it. Look at this heliocentric model where we can see the planets revolving around the sun. Galileo supported the model for which the Roman Catholic Church sentenced him to life imprisonment in 1633. Unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church punished him for supporting the truth. The poem, The Sun Rising, is an obad. Unlike other obads, the poet does not greet the sun, but rather scolds the sun. Besides the power of love, we can read the poem through the lens of post-colonialism and feminism. If you are interested, you can read it on the blog. The link will be in the description below. Anyway, through logic, the poet justifies his love, so what about you? How will you defend your love?